Uh, well, it's getting more difficult, I think, oddly enough. It was when I, when I was a journalist um, and was accustomed to tossing off 600 words, 1,000 words very rapidly, and someone said to me, well, why not write a book, which in that first instance was a book about Northern Ireland. I found it very easy indeed. Um, and every six months, it seemed, I would turn out another book. But they weren't successful. And I think the fact that they weren't successful, or the reason why they weren't successful, is because I had devoted so little time to them. I had tossed them off in the same way that I had done my journalism. They were journalistic books, I think. And looking at them now, I mean, they do have a certain sort of innocent freshness to them, I suppose, some of them do. But you can see why they weren't critically or commercially very much of a success. They weren't noticed. And I think the lesson I learned is that to write a decent book, you've got to put an awful lot of work into it. They're very hard things to do. For me, the book that changed it all was a book I wrote on the Yangtze called The River at the Centre of the World, which was extremely well reviewed. It didn't do commercially at all well, but it made me feel at long last I had written a book of which I could be proud. I'd felt I'd worked hard at it and I had told a story about the China that I'm very fond of in a, in a relatively serious way and, uh, and uh, I'd constructed a, a good book. But the book that changed everything for me in a professional sense as opposed to my own personal sort of intellectual and spiritual sense was The Professor and the Madman and that came out of a clear blue sky. It was in a way almost a journalistic idea. It was just a very good story which was presented to me on a plate. Someone said there was this American lunatic murderer who was a, a contributor to the Oxford English Dictionary, and I thought, that is an amazing story. Has it ever been written in a book? And it turned out it hadn't. And so I wrote it, and wrote it relatively quickly once I had used such skills as I had as a journalist to unearth all the information. And that book, for some extraordinary reason, well, for a lot of reasons which are not extraordinary, actually, and to do with marketing and publicity and, and luck, became an enormous and continues to this day to be a very considerable commercial success. So, for me, The River at the Centre of the World changed my writing life for my bank manager and my family <laughs> and the world around me. The Professor and the Madman changed my life. Not really. I had written, after that, I had written a book on the Balkans, which was not particularly successful, but I enjoyed doing it. And then I wrote a book about an early geologist, William Smith, um, The Map That Changed the World. And I went back, this must have been about four years after The Professor was published, to the village where William Smith was born in Oxfordshire, a place called Churchill, and was giving a speech in the local bookstore. And after it was all over and the people had had their books signed and so forth, a young woman came up to me and said, you remember The Professor and the Madman? And I, of course I remembered it. I mean, it's a book I shall never forget. And she said, you would agree, would you not, that that was a footnote to history? And I said, yes. I mean, it was a fascinating footnote, but yes, it was a footnote. And she said, well, would you like to write a book, the history to which that was the footnote? And I said, you mean the, the book about the the whole story of the making of the OED, the Oxford English Dictionary. And she said, yes, because I'm a commissioning editor at Oxford, and if you'd like to do it, we'd love to have you do it. And so that's how it was born. I was aware of, of two things. The Professor and the Madman, I, I don't want to be boring about this, but this is what happened. The, the Oxford English Dictionary, a 20-volume monster of a book, was selling incredibly slowly. He was sitting in a warehouse in Oxford, well, in Northamptonshire, oddly enough, near, very near where my parents live. And um, it was selling at the rate of about 50 sets a year, which is nothing. And the president of Oxford University Press, New York, an incredible woman called Laura Brown, rang Oxford, knowing that The Professor and the Madman was about to be published, and said, how many sets of the OED do you have left in your warehouse? And they said, uh, 900. And she said, well, you sell them at about 50 a year. That means it'll be 80 years before you sell all of them. And they said, yes, but I mean, we're Oxford University Press. This is what we're accustomed to doing. And she said, I, Laura, Oxford, New York, will buy the lot. And they said, you're mad. You'll never sell them. Trust me, she said. So the professor and the madman came out, and with it, a little publicity sticker saying, if you've interested, found this book interesting, buy under the term madman special 
an OED reduced from $3,000 to 995 They all went in a matter of weeks. They've been back to the presses now, I think, 11 times at 3,000 volumes a time. So something like 30,000 units of the OED have been sold as a direct result either of The Professor and the Madman or of this new book, The Meaning of Everything. So they have been, to me, inordinately generous. And about three months ago, a leather-bound copy of the OED arrived at my house for Oxford saying, thank you for allowing us to sell an apparently unsaleable book. Yes, I mean, I took a degree in it. I wouldn't dignify it by saying a training. I mean, I was an appallingly bad one, but yes, that's what I took my degree in. What I wanted to do before I went to college was be a sailor. I mean, I had this idea that I would be in command at the age I am now, which is 60, of um, an aircraft carrier putting down sort of small wars in corners of the British Empire. But it wasn't to be because it turned out that I was red, green, colorblind. And the Navy takes a rather dim view of people that can't tell red lights from green lights being at the helm of a multi-million dollar aircraft carrier. So that particular dream had to go out of the window. And so I thought, well, another way of wandering around the world dressing up in shorts was to be a geologist, because you'd see recruiting posters showing happy-looking SO geologists in the wilds of Africa with a hammer. And I thought, I could do that. And so I applied to Oxford and got in and did geology for three years and got a very modest degree. A degree, actually, which has got a name in Britain. It's called a, um, a Desmond, and it comes from the play on words of Desmond Tutu, the South African Archbishop, because it was a 2-2, which is a second-class degree and the second tier of that class. So anyway, armed with this Desmond, there was nothing really I could do other than become a commercial geologist. And so I went to Uganda and lived in a tent on the flanks of the Ruanzori Mountains in Uganda and worked looking for copper. I didn't find a microgram of copper in the entire time I was there. But um, it was fascinating and began a love affair that I've had ever since with Africa to where I will be going, I think, when we finish the San Francisco book. So, but I didn't perform well at geology and then read a book which completely changed my life. This book, which I borrowed from a library in Uganda, this is not the library copy I bought, my own copy, <laughs> I have to say, is by a, a writer who I at the time had never heard of called James Morris, and it's called Coronation Everest. And I was very interested in climbing, and this book was about, written by James, who was the London Times correspondent, on the successful Mount Everest expedition of 1953. And he was the man who not only, never having climbed before, got to 27,500 feet up the mountain, but sent, with a very elaborate system of codes, coded messages, the news that Hillary and Tensing had got to the summit back to London in time for that, what for the British was a very glorious piece of news, to be published in the Times of London on the 2nd of June 1953, which was the morning of the Queen's coronation. Now, I remember this as a little boy. I was, I don't know, eight or something. And it was a wonderful, it rained like hell, I remember, but it was a wonderful day because we had this new queen taking the charge of our country. But also, this news that this mountain had been climbed by a British expedition was a last sort of imperial hurrah for us. We knew the empire was going down the tubes, but this was a moment of glory. And so here was the book about it, which I read what would that be, another 11 years later, 15 years later in Uganda. And I thought, this is what I want to be. I'm not a good geologist, I can't be a sailor, but maybe I can wander around the world telling stories about people. And so I wrote to this chap, James Morris, without knowing anything about him, saying, dear Mr. Morris, I'm a 21-year-old geologist living in Africa. Can I be you, essentially? And I found four or five years ago the letter he wrote back, which was a model of kindness and wisdom, saying essentially, if you really, really believe that you can be a writer, then my advice to you is simply this. The day you receive this letter, go to your office, resign, come back to England, and get yourself a job on a local newspaper, and then if you do that, write to me again. Well, I did. I handed in my notice, I went to Entebbe, I caught the plane back to London, and arrived 
having no idea what I was going to do. I had a degree which is entirely irrelevant to journalism. I was, had no money. I had a young wife. And um, I thought, I've really made a mistake. But then I started reading other books by James Morris about Venice and about Spain and about Oxford. And I thought, he's got the same sort of, I mean, sort of mind that I would love to have. And so I took a temporary job working on an oil rig in the North Sea for an American company, but all the time applying to newspapers. And all of them said, you know, we need a 21-year-old geologist like we need a hole in the head. Except that one eventually said, OK, we'll try you out. And it was a paper in the northeast of England in Newcastle-upon-Tyne. And so I worked as a lowly reporter covering, you know, car crashes and warehouse fires and that sort of thing. But I wrote to James and I said, I've done it. I've done what you advised, so what now? And in his reply, you could sort of sense the gulp of, you took my advice? I mean, that really wasn't on the script. Um, but seeing as you had, let me give you some further advice. One, never ever lose your sense of wonder about the world. This is an extraordinary place. You're privileged to be on it. And if you're going to write about it, you will have a wonderful time doing so. Secondly, don't bother to learn shorthand. Simply a waste of time. Anything that people say to you that's memorable, you'll remember. I guarantee you that. And thirdly, every month or so, package up your clippings and send them to me in North Wales, and I will annotate them for you. I'll return them saying whether I think you're any good or not. And so I would send these stories, you know, pigeon fancier loses prize bird, or four nuns in car crash, none hurt, that kind of story. And they would go down to North Wales and they'd come back annotated in this beautiful handwriting, this verb a little infelicitously chosen, this paragraph a little long, this sentence a little lumpy. And we kept up this correspondence for years. I never met him, though, until I was living in Washington, D.C., covering Watergate, because what had happened was I had graduated from that newspaper to The Guardian and had been made the Northeast of England correspondent and then ultimately the Northern Ireland correspondent and survived that experience and was sent to Washington as the number two person on the totem pole to cover America but essentially to cover Watergate because that was what was happening at the time in the early 70s. President Nixon resigned as you'll remember on the 9th of August 1974 and I flew back to Britain to go on holiday and I decided to go climbing in North Wales and I went with an Australian friend of mine and on the way up she said doesn't your friend James Morris live here and I said you're absolutely right but I've actually never spoken to him she said well this is ridiculous you must telephone him and so I telephoned James and he said my god Simon I read you every morning from Washington in the Guardian where are you and I said I'm about five miles away staying in a hotel marvelous he said you must come for tea tomorrow so Jackie and I went, we were climbing a mountain called Triffin, and we came down from the hills and went to the house, first of all to the village called Hlanistamdui, where James lives. And we went, found this gorgeous country house. And I will remember to the end of my days, this moment when I was kneeling on the doorstep, unlacing my climbing boots, because both Jackie and I were filthy dirty. We'd been out on the hills all day. And the door opened and a woman appeared. And I said, oh, hello, uh, I'm Simon Winchester and this is uh, Jackie Leishman. Uh, you must be Mrs. Morris. And this person said, uh, no, I'm James, actually. And I thought, well, this is a bit odd. Well, I thought nothing of it because people grew their hair rather long in the 70s. So this person then said, well, let me introduce you to my wife. And I thought, well, this is some weird Welsh joke. I thought, you know, James had fathered four children, had been a ca captain or a lieutenant in the British Army, had done all, climbed Mount Everest, done all sorts of very manly things. So whoever was going to come in out of the shadows would have a beard and a Yukon Jack shirt, not at all. A nice English lady comes in with a little girl and we all proceed into the drawing room to have tea. And there we were sitting with me, fairly obviously a man, and Jackie, my friend, obviously a young woman and Elizabeth, a middle-aged lady, and Suki, a nice little girl. And my friend, who I'd been communicating with for all these years, 
with all the very evident accoutrements of, of womanhood. Twin set and pearls, necklace, handkerchief tucked up, sleeve and legs decorously crossed. And of course, being Britain, nothing was mentioned about this. We just talked about the weather and the crops and nothing was said. And I left two hours later and Jackie, as we passed through the gates of the house, said, what the f was going on? And I said, I've not the foggiest idea. And then two days later, I got this letter. Dear Simon, I'm sorry to have put you through what must have been a somewhat peculiar social ordeal, but the fact of the matter is that I've decided to become a woman and I'm going to Casablanca next week and providing everything is successful, I'll be reborn as I'm going to take the name Jan Morris and I hope that you can understand and accept this and that we'll be the best of friends. Well, we are, we have been the best of friends. We're having lunch tomorrow in New York. We've written a book called Stones of Empire Together about the British architecture in India. I dedicated my first book, a book on Northern Ireland, to, to, to Jan and she is arguably the most important person in my life uh, in terms of my, I mean, the most distinguished man and later woman of letters. Happily still living with Elizabeth in Wales and she says she, her last book on Trieste is her last book, I disbelieve it. She continues to pump out these wonderful terms and um, I respect and admire and love her. Well, I'm a bit all over the map really, but I, I have only ever tried to write one book of fiction, which is a book called Pacific Nightmare. So it was, it was not a nightmare to do, it was, I think, a nightmare to read, <laughs> and it did not do well. And uh, so I've retreated, I think, into writing what I know reasonably well how to do, which is uh, non-fiction, mainly historical books. Um, they are a bit of a, a dog's breakfast, I'm afraid, but I mean, not only about the past, because of the Northern Ireland book was about the present and about contemporary history in Northern Ireland, I wrote this terribly unsuccessful book called American Heartbeat, which um, had me going up and down Interstate 35, which goes from Duluth, Minnesota to Laredo, Texas, and I thought I would somehow capture the quiddity of America by writing about its Midwest. Well, I might have captured the quiddity, but nobody wanted to read it, and I think in 1977, it was published in 76, there was a royalty statement. I mean, royalty, that's a laughable word in connection with this book. It sold 11 copies, so it was utterly dismal. But um, then I wrote a book about the British aristocracy, and I got horribly sued for it, and the book had to be withdrawn and republished and of course I didn't notice the fine print which says that the author has to indemnify the publisher against costs caused by a successful libel action. So that was a bit of a nightmare but uh, mercifully my publisher stuck with me and then slowly, slowly, slowly these non-fiction books started to, started to sell. I think because I just wouldn't go away. I think that was, as someone said in, in writing and I firmly believe this to be the case, that persistence is hugely important. Just keep, keep at it. Yes, I was. I mean, I was in Northern Ireland for three years, essentially from uh, the latter part of 1968 until early 1972, so nearly four years. So all the, or many of the really sort of canonically bad events of which I suppose Bloody Sunday would be the, the nadir or the apex, um, I was there for. And indeed, only a couple of years ago, I had to go back and testify to the Bloody Sunday inquiry, which Tony Blair set up to try and right the wrongs, the perceived wrongs of that event. And it is very strange being asked to remember, I mean, asked on oath and being, inquis being quizzed by seven extremely able lawyers, what color coat a particular victim was wearing and did he have his sleeves rolled up and were you standing with your back to the fish and chip shop or were you facing it? I did my best, but it's 30 years, it's a long time. What happened was I was, it's a long story and I don't want to bore you with it, but basically I was in India doing a very, what we call souffle journalism, a non-important story for a, a magazine. And uh, one of the editors of the Sunday Times said, sent me a telegram, I was up in Simla in the Himalaya, saying return to London immediately, from no explanation. And I thought, oh my God, this is a problem with my expenses, which was the normal <laughs> problem on the Sunday Times, and uh, I, so I flew back. I went down by taxi to Delhi, caught or Bombay, and took a plane to London and arrived somewhat nervous and sheepish at the desk of Cal McChrystal, the foreign editor. And I said, Cal, you know, I'm sure I've got all the receipts. I'm sure whatever you think 
didn't happen. And he said, no, no, it's nonsense. We want you to go to the Falkland Islands, and we want you to go today. And I said, why? And he said, well, there's this bit of a disturbance between the British and the Argentinians, and there are two naval vessels which are looking at each other in a menacing kind of way, and we think there may be some trouble. So I went to Madrid and caught an aerolineous flight to Buenos Aires and turned up, and I had one friend in BA who I'd been at school with and who was perhaps the only friend I have in the world who at the time was a spy. I knew he was a spy. And I rang him and we went and had lunch. And I said, you know, word to the wise old boy is, what's going to happen? Could I, is there going to be an invasion? And he said, you know, nod is as good as a wink to a blind horse. Um, you can go to the Falkland Islands, but I think you may have trouble getting back which I took to mean that if I went during the time I was there, there would be some military activity. So I went down there and um, had an extraordinary time. And I, there was a small garrison of British Royal Marines there, one of whom, a chap called Gary Newt, I knew from, I'd seen him in Belize in Central America about three years ago. And I had written a piece about how his soldiers were shooting manatees in the jungle streams of British, what used to be British Honduras, and I wrote a story which the headline of which man's inhumanity to manatees, and it made him very embarrassed and extremely cross with me. So when I turn up again like a bad penny in the Falkland Islands three years later, he's not best pleased to see me. And I said, come on, I mean, that's, you were shooting manatees, so it was legitimate for me to write a piece. And he said, oh, all right. And I said, well, what's going on here? And he said, well, there's all these politicians are making noises and there is the possibility that we'll be invaded. And what I hear, he said, is that if we are invaded, they will be sent sending about 20 ships with about 8,000 men on board. We're 60 men. So I think he said, we'll come a pretty good second, but I think we will come second. And sure enough, three days later, an invasion force came in and Gary's men, I mean, I think they, they killed three of the Argentine invaders, but basically, the souvenir, the, the, um, the surrender came at about nine o'clock in the morning and it was very exciting, hiding under the governor's bed and being raked with machine gun fire and that sort of thing. And then um, I, they were all deported and the governor was deported, but I was allowed to stay on the island for a couple of days. And then I was deported to southern Patagonia and made my way up to Buenos Aires, where briefly I was sort of lionized because I had been one of the people that had seen the invasion. Bob Schieffer, CBS reporter, who then went on to become a great friend, uh, he interviewed me and I felt, my God, you know, I've, I'm, I'm becoming a notorious figure. And uh, then the notoriety did happen because about a week later I was back down in southern Patagonia with a, two friends of mine from British papers, um, a chap called Ian Mather, who was a reporter I had known in Beirut, and a photographer called Tony Prime. And we were detained by the Argentine Navy and then charged with spying and put in prison for the rest of the war and uh, we were there for three months. So it was frustrating hearing all my friends covering the war that then broke out, particularly Max Hastings, who's a great professional rival of mine. He just cleaned up. I mean, he actually walked into Port Stanley before the British troops. It's often said that Max took the Argentine surrender. He went on to become editor of the Daily Telegraph, editor of the Evening Standard. He's now Sir Max Hastings. And I often think, I mean, I'm not in the slightest bit bitter, I mean, Max is a very great friend of mine, that if I hadn't been stupid enough to be put in prison, I would have been alongside Max and we would have been battling for who actually got into Philip Stanley first. And I might have a knighthood and he might not have gone on to be editor of the Standard. Well, I kept a diary mm -hmm. and then when I came out, a publisher said, um, did you keep a diary? Could we publish it? And um, what I did was the, the printable parts of the diary, and I think most of the diary were published, but interspersed with letters from people that wrote in from the civilian world, and they were most writing to me in prison, saying, you know, chin up, it's, it's going to be all right. And there was one letter in there by a woman called Rosemary Theobald, who every time I read it, I just, I get so moved by it. It's just the most beautiful, beautiful letter. And it cheered me up in prison, and it cheers me up today. Well, to go to the map, first of all, yes, the map that hangs up behind this curtain in the Geological Society of London is available, although 
in the funny, sort of peculiarly British way, they're a bit grumpy about people ringing the doorbell and saying, hi, I'm an American, can I come and see this map? Uh, they're thinking of charging people money to see it, which I think is utterly ludicrous. I think it's a, a national treasure. So, but it is available. Burlington House is opposite Fortnum and Mason, so afterwards you can go in and have a cup of tea. But it may be a bit of a struggle. You ring the doorbell and some slightly grumpy person will say, oh no, another American's come to see the map. I wish, wish that book had never been written. Absent that, you'll have a wonderful time because it's an extraordinary map. But how did I come across the story? Well, I had written this book, The Professor and the Madman, and my editor, who was this extraordinary man called Larry Ashmead, had, once all the fuss had died down, had tried to analyze why it was a success. Because when you think about it, and I certainly thought about this, why on earth would a story about lexicography pique the public interest to the extent it did? I mean, lexicography is a really boring subject, potentially. And Larry said, if you look at the book, it is for four reasons. That you have a, a hitherto unknown human being, just an ordinary person, in this case, William, um, W.C. Minor, who makes an amazing contribution to human society in all the work he did with the OED. The trajectory of his life is dramatically up and down, hugely successful moments and deeply terrible moments. And then, and Larry was being slightly facetious, you've got the added bonus that in his case he was involved in grotesque bodily mutilation. Now, because this is a family audience, you probably won't want me to describe what this mutilation was, but suffice to say, he injured himself horribly. So Larry said, those four criteria, do you know anybody else that fits the bill and that had those four criteria attaching to him? And of course I said, Larry, don't be ridiculous. I don't know anybody like that. And he said, well, think about it. So I went home and thought about it, and I did actually remember, oddly enough, stemming from the days when I lived on Cummings Lane in Chevy Chase, Maryland, where indeed I spent last night with a great friend and artist friend of mine called Jean Meisel, that there was a neighbor um, called Greeley who we babysat for the Greeley children. And they loaned us their cottage in New Hampshire. And in that cottage one day, and it must have been in the summer of 1973, I found a treasure trove of documents relating to an expedition that their grandfather, who was called Adolphus Washington Greeley, had taken to the Arctic in the late 1880s. And this man had been accused of cannibalism because all sorts of his expedition uh, members had died and some had indeed been cannibalized. And he was, when he survived and returned, was treated as a pariah. His career went up and down in a very dramatic way. He was one of the founders of the National Geographic magazine. He did a lot of great things, but he was accused of very bad things, wrongly so, and he was involved in bodily mutilation, allegedly. So this was a possible candidate, and so I went up to the Arctic and retraced his steps, and then I came down to the Library of Congress here in Washington and found that somebody else had been looking through his papers. Somebody else was on the same trail, and it turned out it was a man living in Richmond, Virginia, who, a Welshman who had been working on the Greeley story for essentially a quarter of a century. And so I felt in all Christian conscience, I couldn't sort of elbow him aside and say, let me write it. So I rang up Larry and said, what am I going to do? I think the Greeley story is not going to happen. And he said, well, think of something else. Weren't you once upon a time a geologist? And I said, yes, but a very bad one. He said, think of someone from your geological past. And I thought of this man, William Smith, who I remembered had created this map of the world. But I knew very little about him. I looked him up in Britannica. There was a very short entry, but it whetted my appetite because it said Smith William, born Churchill, Oxfordshire, 1769, creator of the first ever geological map of the world. And then it went on to say the map was plagiarized. He went to debtor's prison. He became bankrupt. His wife went insane and she became a nymphomaniac. And I thought nymphomania, well, that's not grotesque bodily mutilation, but it has the same bizarre aspect to it. Maybe this will work. However, I didn't know that someone else hadn't written a book about William Smith, so I remembered that it was my old tutor, Harold Redding at Oxford, who told me about him. So I thought I'd ring him up, but then I realized that 40 years had gone past since I was at Oxford, or 35. I mean, Harry, Harold Evans, uh, Harold uh, Redding was not a young man when he was my tutor, so goodness knows what had happened. So I rang up 
And I was obviously very hesitant on the switchboard when I was put through. And I said, hello, I was a student here in 1963 to 66. Harold Redding, is he still? And I hesitated. And the woman at the other end said, is alive the word you're searching for? And I said, well, to put it bluntly, yes. And she said, you've got to know something about geologists, that old geologists never die. They just, they fossilize, she said. And Harold is very much alive. He's just come back from an expedition in Baluchistan, and I'll put you through to his room. And so I was put through, and I said, Professor Redding, this is, you probably have long forgotten me, but my name's Simon Winchester. I was a student there in the 1960s. And he said, oh, yes, he said, weren't you the one that became a, a journalist or something rather vulgar? And I said, yes, but nowadays I write books, and I'm thinking of writing a book about William Smith. And there was this wonderfully eloquent silence down the line. And then he said, Simon, if you would do me the honor of writing a book about William Smith and telling his story, it would vindicate, I think, all the hours that I'm now beginning to remember when I tried to hammer geology into your skull. So he opened all the keys, all the, all the locks for me, and I dedicated the book to him, and he was delighted. So uh, it was wonderful to revisit Oxford and Harold Redding and the learning that I had only peripherally absorbed so many years before and bring it all back in this one book. Yes. Well, I don't know whether, how, whether they taught evolution in an aggressive sort of way, but a uh, bad-tempered looking boy with his um, surplus off to one side, if that's what it is. Um, I was obviously in the choir in those days. But uh, yes, Darwin was very much a student of William Smith, and uh, I'm sure he would have come to his evolutionary theory in all sorts of other directions, but Lyle, Hutton, Smith, Darwin forms a sort of a seamless line. Well, I think about the jacket. There's this wonderful designer at HarperCollins who is trying to outdo himself, I think, with every jacket he does. And he, with the map that changed the world in hardback, he actually folded, and they had to be hand-folded, the map itself, reduced, I think, to quarter scale. But they made a, a folded jacket. I think it had to be done in Hong Kong, which added considerably to the book's production costs. And having done that, they then thought, well, what can we do for Krakatoa? And he produced this strange, curiously laminated, very well-designed, uh, we're talking about the hardback. It's, it's similar, but the, the hardback has uh, one jacket which folds on top of another I jacket. See. It's a sort of, it's like what they call a belly band, only it's bigger than a belly band, if that doesn't sound too alliterative. Um, so I'm working on this book on San Francisco now, and I, I <laughs> dread to think what he's got in mind. But to give you one example, they had a, what they called a dump bin, which is the bins that go in the shops to uh, promote the book. Because I have to accept that moving a book about you know, a fairly dense scientific subject or a dense, dry subject like lexicography, you do welcome any push that the publishers will give you. And in this case, they created a dump bin which had a cutout of the volcano, the very picture that's on the jacket, from the Illustrated London News, with um, flashing lights from at the back of it, which were red and which looked, therefore, as if it was the volcano was erupting. But in the initial design of this, they also had a, a sensor. And if you waved your hand in front of it, it produced an incredible roaring sound. Well, of course, bookstore owners were appalled by this because they said all that's going to happen is little Johnny is going to come out of the SUV and wave his hand and say, look, kids, and the whole house, the whole bookstore is going to be full of children not buying books but making this infernal thing roar in an incredibly irritating way. So they dumped the sound. Um, the second part of your question, though, was about empire, empire, I think, which is obviously somewhat more serious. I'm a, a continued apologist for the British Empire. I don't think I'd go quite as far as Lord Rosebery and say it was the greatest secular force for good in the history of the world. I, I think I, I, my views have become tempered. I don't think empire, generally speaking, is a good thing, and I certainly don't think what is happening at the moment, this insidious new empire that is growing up around the world, isn't ultimately, I think, a very bad thing. But I think one of the things that the British Empire did have going for it is that the men and women, and I have to say largely men, who went out to administer it tended to be people with a very good heart and a very good brain. 
and they came to know and to study and became academically and intellectually fascinated by the places that they were district officers in or district commissioners or whatever and the amount of scholarship and pure knowledge that flowed back into Britain and then from Britain to the world about the Ashanti or about Basuta land or about the Falkland Islands and whether the scholarship relates to the bird life or the animal life or the history or the, the culture or the anthropology it's there in huge amounts the the legacy of the british empire in to the in the form of learning is prodigious and i think very few empires that have existed and, and once again i must reiterate that my general view is that it's a terrible impertinence that one country can think it can rule another can invade another can be involved intimately in the day-to-day -day running of another country and that that is it shouldn't happen but given that the British Empire is a reality of, the his, of history, what we now know about the world, because of these learned and well-intentioned men that went out to rule the world on our behalf, is a legacy that I think is important and, and needs to be cherished and respected. Well, gosh, that's, uh, that's not a difficult question to answer, really. I mean, at least as far as I'm concerned. I mean, Jan's mantra revolves around kindness. I, she wrote, uh, we both contributed to, but she wrote the lead essay for a book which Lonely Planet um, edited, published about a year ago, called The Kindness of Strangers. And I wrote about a trivial little incident that happened to me on Ascension Island in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. But Jan wrote about tripping over, I think, in St. Petersburg and how someone was kind to her and then goes on to expatiate on this idea of kindness, how being kindly to your fellow human beings and to the world in which you live is surely the guiding mantra of everyone who lives here. And if you look at a person who decides to change gender as she did or a person who opts for a particular a different type of lifestyle from one's own, providing they are kind to you, then your attitude to them should be one of kindness. And kindness, of course, embraces tolerance. So I've learned an awful lot from Jan, not the very least of which is how to, to write at least mod moderately well. I don't believe to this day I will ever attain the kind of brilliance that she displayed in books like her trilogy of Empire, Pax Britannica trilogy, which is a stunning, stunning work of scholarship and very easy and wonderful to read. But as well as t teaching me about writing, I think she has left with me, and perhaps because of, by example, showing me how to treat with her as a person of a different gender, has taught me a degree of tolerance and reminded me all the time that kindness is a tremendously important virtue. I'm not always kind. I'm sure Jan isn't always kind, but one one tries to be. Well, the funny thing, I mean, there are a number of stories to tell. I was on a West Coast book tour, as you know. A, a young woman who, whose name I perhaps won't give was very, very helpful to me in the writing of The Professor and the Madman. And after the book came out, we fell out for all sorts of horrible reasons. I mean, it wasn't, wasn't a personal relationship, it was a professional relationship, and it all had to do with money. And so for two years, what had been a great friendship between this woman, whose first name I can give, it's Marisa, uh, we were sundered. It was a very unfortunate situation, and all my friends were saying, why are you and Marisa not talking anymore? And I said I didn't want to talk about it. Anyway, I came to the bookstore in Menlo Park and did the reading on the map that changed the world. And I had just been at the University of Chicago teaching, uh, maybe six months before. So then the line of people that want to have their books signed forms and I sit down at the table and take a glass of water and prepare a pen and the first person in line was a student of mine from the University of Chicago with her mother to say thank you for teaching at Chicago. The second was 
the parents of a, another completely different student of mine from the University of Chicago, who oddly enough also lived in Menlo Park. And the third person was Marisa. And she just came up to me, held my hand and said, I'm so sorry for everything that happened, burst into tears. And of course, it completely polaxed me. I mean, there am I supposed to be writing a book and I have this sobbing woman and a relationship that had been sundered, now suddenly rekindled. And I said, well, let's have lunch tomorrow up in San Francisco and then we can sort out everything. Because I mean, I, it's horrible having bad relationships with other people and things that puzzle you and don't go away. And at last, everything was back on track. So I was so happy and I left the bookstore and I said to my driver, you know, that was a great reading and the audience was so wonderful and there were these two students from Chicago and their parents, but you know, the thing that has really made that for me is the fact that Marisa has come back into my life. And I drove back to San Francisco full of vim and vigor and thinking I've got one radio interview to do with the Pacifica station in Berkeley and then it's lunch with Marisa, isn't that going to be great? And then I was shaving and what did I see on television but the planes going into the World Trade Center and of course everything, everything was off and the phones weren't working and I had to rent a car and drive all the way back to Sandersfield, Massachusetts which took, well, three days or so and everything changed for all of us and uh, I've spoken to Marisa since the friendship is back on track but neither she nor I nor evidently you will ever forget that, that reading, but for reasons that have nothing at all to do with the reading. Well, it's interesting, and I don't want to be too confessional here, but when I was 19, I, was, I suffered from some strange disorder, which I found the name of it in dsm 4 when I was, which is the volume of, uh, that uh, enumerates and classifies all mental problems. And I suffered from this thing this called a dissociative disorder for about two years, and it was deeply debilitating, and in the end was taken off to a hospital in the north of England when I was now working as a reporter, and given six sessions of um, electroconvulsive therapy, ECT, uh, which for a while, because it completely cured everything. I mean, I, I've never had a depressive moment since. It made me very, very sympathetically interested in ECT as a treatment, however empirical and risky it may be. And it's given me a lifelong fascination and, I believe, genuine sympathy for people who are mentally unwell. So when I came to write this book and discovered that WC minor was almost certainly a paranoid schizophrenic and looked at the way he had been treated by Victorian asylum um, superintendents who had no real knowledge of what was going on in this poor man's brain and thought the best thing was to keep him warm and well fed and isolated but in a generally congenial set of surroundings but there was very little cruelty in Broadmoor in the late 19th century and the recognition that was given to his obvious talent as a lexicographer and his musical abilities and his learning and his erudition, the fact that this was all allowed to, to flower within the asylum, it made me think that people who ran his life were very compassionate and sympathetic and it reinforced my own belief that um, a sympathetic attitude to people who are mentally unwell is, is tremendously important and so it, it didn't so much change my attitude as reinforce what I had learned through my own experience in the 1960s. Well, I think in a way the reader quite likes it, likes to know that if I write in an ex cathedra sort of way, uh, it, it, it makes my book seem, I would imagine, much more academic, much more authoritative. And I can't claim that any book that I write is authoritative. I am a storyteller, and Krakatoa was a story. And the book I'm writing now about San Francisco is essentially a story, although there's a lot of sort of dis discursive theorizing, and, and, and that does have a somewhat ex cathedra tone. But I think the reader quite likes having a, a feeling that my guide is with me and leading me along. I mean, in the, in the map that changed the world, for instance, I take this journey across the outcrop of the Jurassic, uh, 
from Dorset to Yorkshire. And I think, th I mean, the response I've had from, particularly in America, oddly enough, when I wrote, I'm now remembering it, I wrote the book with this as the sort of the fulcrum, the, the chapter at the centre of the book was about, OK, I'm going to break off from talking about William Smith's life, I'm going to talk about the outcrop of the Jurassic, and I make a journey, and this is my, you know, self-indulgent it may be, but this is my record of the journey from South Dorset to, to North Yorkshire, hoping that it'll help explain something about William Smith. My editor in London hated it. She said, don't do that. This is an irrelevant chapter. You can put it in somewhere, maybe it should be the foreword or the preface. But Larry Ashmead, this extraordinary editor that I like so much and has had such an effect on my life, he said, no, this is absolutely the core of the book. This is the part of the book that many people will remember because they'll, they'll feel that they're being told this story by, by a friend. I don't mean to sound too sappy, but someone who isn't academic and isolated and clinical and writing in an ex-cathedra manner. He's taking you along by the hand. So I think Larry was right, and the editor, with whom I'm still on very good terms in London, was a little less so. Well, I certainly did find, I mean, it was no particular um, effort expended. I mean, I found, I think, in Wuhan, in a dockyard there, this rather forlorn old steel-hulled, I think, yacht is it's going a bit far. That conjures up ideas of, um, you know, the Mediterranean. This was a rather grubby-looking, um, more like a tug than a yacht. But yes, it was there with all the flock wallpaper and the rather ugly pink carpets, and it made a, certainly a couple of pages in, a book, in the book that I was writing about, about the Yangtze. But Asia, well, uh, the, the woman I live with, the woman I love, Elaine, is Chinese, and she's very, very proud of China and its achievements, and she's the editor of a a contemporary art magazine, Art Asia Pacific. And so my life is very much bound up in Asia, not so much southeast, more northeast. I love Korea. I wrote a book about Korea, which is going to be reprinted and republished in this country next year. It's just come out in Britain. And we, Elaine and I, have said that once um, I've finished, I haven't told my publishers yet, this yet, but once I've got one book to do on a French mathematician next year, and then a very short book on Hong Kong, which will take the two of us back to back to Hong Kong, um, then we're going to go and live in Beijing for a year and learn Chinese. She largely to speak it, me to write and to read and to write it, because one of my ambitions now, I'm, I'm quite keen on letterpress printing, and I have a small press, and I would love to buy a bigger press, but specifically to print Chinese poetry, because I don't think I'd have the hand to do calligraphy, but I love Chinese writing. And so she and I, I think, will be firmly wedded to, well, to each other, I imagine, but also to, to Southeast Asia or Northeast Asia for the rest of our days. Disraeli said the East is a career, and it's a career that I happily embrace. I miss it. I love where I live in Massachusetts now, um, but I love Asia and all things Asian. I've been married twice, and uh, the first marriage founded because I was never, I was never there. Um, but I have four children, and they've, um, they grew up here. In fact, earlier today, I went to look at the house on 11th Street where I lived and to see the wall at the back of the house that I actually built with my hands. It still stands 20 years later. I contributed a small amount of masonry to Washington. Um, but they're all happy and well. And Well, the oldest one, Rupert, is a writer. He's 38 now. And he actually, he and I have just written a book together about Calcutta. He loves Calcutta. We were in India together for three years. Um, but no, I, I'm not proud of the fact that two marriages bit the dust. 30, Angus is 35, uh, Alexander's 32, and Hattie is 17. Believe you me, I, although I have for the last few years been writing about history, I am keenly fascinated by America. I've chosen to live here. I'm just about getting my green card, which allows me to live here permanently. I fully intend to be a citizen. Um, Elaine, my partner, is very politically aware and, and active, and I think the two of us, it's a little more difficult for me because I could easily be thrown out of this country. I think I'm very well aware of what you're talking about. I don't necessarily agree with the, perhaps the extreme edge of some of the points you make, but I was fairly appalled by the way that the protesters were treated in, uh, 
in Boston, and I'm concerned about what's going to happen in New York City when the uh, next convention is held. So to write about American politics, to declaim about things that I love about this country but that I am fearful about in this country's makeup today is something that would certainly be something I'd like to do. Whether my publishers would like me to write that sort of thing, I'm not sure. But believe you me, I am aware and I'm genuinely sympathetic to what you're saying. Well, take heart from the fact that my first successful book came out when I was 55. As I mean, the professor and the madman, before that, I had written and written and written and nobody wanted to read. So as I think it was my mother said, you know, after 55 years, you're an overnight success. Um, I would say persistence. I think I've used that word earlier. It's just if you really feel this burning urge to write, if you have an ability to write, and other people will be able to tell whether you've got an ability to write, if you've got the ability and the urge, then just hammer away. But the most important thing, and this is what I, whenever I'm fortunate enough to be asked to teach, that I hammer away at teaching my students, is the primacy of the story, of the idea. To write a, a vague diatribe or a vague memoir, something that is sort of inchoate and ill-determined is not a good idea. However good a writer you may be, the thing that carries the book from, or carries the reader through the book is a good idea and a good story. And if you can find such a thing, and I was very lucky to find the professor and the madman because, my word, a madman, a murderer who contributes to the greatest book in the English language anonymously from a cell in an asylum and that he happens to be an American. I mean, what a... The stars really came into alignment with that story. Look for stories like that. Keep your antennae functioning. People will say something to you. You'll meet someone who's got an extraordinary story to tell. Doesn't matter whether you're 58 or 98. If you can tell that story, then you'll be the writer you want to be. Uh, all of the recent books are, yes, uh, beforehand, they were, no, nobody wanted to. They went from the typewriter to the remainder table. Italy, oddly enough, the Yangtze book, it really depends. For some reason, the Italians loved the Yangtze book. The Germans are at the moment loving the Krakatoa book. And now I'm, uh, the Japanese have suddenly glommed onto the Krakatoa book. Um, of course, they have a lot of volcanoes in Japan, Unzen being the most infamous. It really depends. Uh, Holland, they didn't particularly go for the Krakatoa book, which is odd considering it's about a story of an event in a Dutch imperial possession. But they loved, um, I think they loved the Balkan book and they loved the Yangtze book. So they do sell. And in bizarre places, Iceland apparently have a following, Israel a small following. Um, but in little pockets all over the world, and for unpredictable reasons, the books do seem to sell. Well, I think it's very difficult for a geologist, uh, and I call myself a geologist very loosely, to be anything other than a believer in evolution and uh, having some sceptical view about um, our position in the world, our position in the universe. Um, oddly enough, I'd been encouraged to read uh, some works recently by a geologist in Alaska who I met a few weeks ago about how a, how a geologist and a person that knows the Earth is 4.2 billion years old and that this is one of a almost infinitely large number of planets that may, many of which may sustain life. All of these things which would be an assault on a, on a faith-based religion he said you should read some science philosophers, some contemporary scientists who also are interested and who are believers. I'm still a skeptic as far as faith-based religion is concerned. But like many people as they grow older, you begin to question and you begin to worry and to wonder whether your dogmatic rationality is in fact fair. And when you come across a story like William Smith challenging the accepted views that the Earth was formed, you know, 6,000 years ago, and Archbishop Usher and all of that mumbo-jumbo, which I firmly believe to be mumbo-jumbo, he presents you the rational picture that the Earth is very old, which leads Darwin to present the rational picture that man evolved, species came about as a result of natural selection but he doesn't nonetheless answer the central question. 
why are we here, all those sorts of things. And so I still grapple with them, even though I believe I am enlightened by having come to know the works of people like William Smith. So it's a very complex uh, process, and uh, that's part of the joy of writing, that you, that you study these subjects and you write about them, and, and, and you learn so much along the way. And of course, the more you learn, the more you don't know. Uh, the meaning of everything is littered with footnotes, but I do not like end notes. Um, I just, I don't believe the books that I write are, um, have the sort of academic heft that requires footnotes at the end. Increasingly, I think, as I grapple with more and more serious subjects like the San Francisco earthquake, people will, might want to say, well, where did you get this from? And I think this is the kind of footnote that the reader is mm -hmm, talking about. So. Well, I love footnotes. I love that the pre present a sort of quirky, parenthetical remark that'll make people laugh or be amused or gee whiz, or I never knew that. But ones that simply say where this line came from, to me, that's not the kind of writing that I ever want to do. I admire those who do. I'm not a scholarly writer. I'm a storyteller. And I know Jan Morris, my guru. This is no defense. I mean, I don't feel I I'm, should be defending this point of view. I'm merely rather aggressively stating it. I, she told a story about the British Empire. She told a story about Venice or about Spain. I'm telling a story about San Francisco or Krakatoa or the professor and the madman. Others can write. William Smith is a good example. I mean, there is a work in preparation, the definitive biography of William Smith by a man called Hugh Torrens. That book will be littered with footnotes and endnotes, and every citation imaginable will be there. But it will be a very, very different book from the kind of book that I'm attempting. Okay. Yes, of course, and all the books that I've used and all the papers that I've cited are there at the back under recommendations for further reading or whatever. Um, so it is all there for anyone that wants to check. But I simply say that it, if if I say that this sentence came from page 39 of that book or that academic paper, to me it slows things down. It makes the reading more irksome than I think it needs to be. Mercifully, thus far, only one person has, and it was so difficult for me, about two years ago, someone who has read, oddly enough, the map that changed the world, said that a paragraph about the splitting of something called Stonesfield Slate was similar to a paragraph in a book by Jaquetta Hawkes written in 1952 about the English landscape, which I cited in the collection of books for recommended further reading. And I looked at them and I said, yes, it was clearly evident that in writing this, I read that. I didn't copy it out. I mean, I, there were no two words that followed each other in the same order. But I can see that the echo of Jack Etta Hawkes is present in here. But it put the fear of God in me, because this was at the time when Doris Kearns Goodwin, Stephen Ambrose, other people had been accused, rightly or wrongly, of sloppiness. And I believe I'm super careful. This, I was really put on the back foot. I, I was so worried. I thought, my God, you know, even the P word, if it's ever mentioned, it can do terrible, terrible damage to your reputation. And so at that point, I did think, well, maybe I should start putting in notes. But then I thought, no, quite honestly, I do want to build up and sustain a trusting relationship between the reader and myself. I would not do such a thing. I know that I would not do such a thing. And so I know I can never be caught at doing it. And so I can say, well, in that case, I'm not going to cause any interruption in the flow of reading by including endnotes. But I can, I can sympathize totally with this, with this reader. But for the time being, anyway, I'm not going to do it. Well, I, I think generally, I, rather than sort of attempt to nail America and what people allege America's doing around the world at the moment, I think what gives me some cause for hope looking to the future is the fact that another potential empire is rising in the East. I think it is tremendously important what is happening in China at the moment, that a country of enormous power, but a country that has essentially kept within its own borders for its entire five and a half thousand years of history, is rising to become a counterforce to an America 
that at the moment is at least charged by some people with sweeping around the world unchecked. She was checked, of course, by the Soviet Union during the Cold War for good or ill. Now she's unchecked and people worry, therefore, that Walmart imperialism and Coca-Cola imperialism is spreading around the world. That, in another 10 or 15 years, is going to be met with a great wall, if you like, of not of fierce military opposition, but a wall that presents another kind of life, another set of ideals, Confucianism, Buddhism, a different way of looking at the world, such that the domination that America is enjoying today will be tempered by another enormous power. Now, it's not going to happen immediately. And so I think we're going to have to suffer, if suffer is the word, the fact that in Kuala Lumpur and in Sydney, we are going to see more and more Walmarts and more and more expressions of what perhaps we don't think is a terribly good influence. But this isn't going to go on forever. There is, as Niall Ferguson would be the first to, to expostulate about, a cyclical aspect to empire. The British Empire had its 200 years. It's now dead and gone. The American Empire, if we're going to call it that, is rising fast. It seems unchecked, but it's going to be checked. And the point is, is it going to be checked in a hostile, agreeable uh, way, or is it going to be checked in an unpleasant and embittered way? And I think we've all got to work to make sure that it's the former rather than the latter. But checked it will be. So I don't think we should worry too much, at least in a historical sense, that the American empire is going to last for hundreds of years and is going to be a bad thing. I think that's all I would say on that point, because it's not my area of expertise, but it does reflect the fact that I'm fascinated by and full of admiration for China, and that's the country to watch, which is why I want to go and learn the language. Well, in answer to your first question, no, I've never written seriously about Africa. I am fascinated, I share with you the view that it's the soft underbelly and one only has to look at what is not getting an enormous amount of publicity in America at the moment, but is actually occupying most thoughtful people's minds in, in Europe at the moment, and that is the situation in Darfur in, uh, in Western Sudan, where clearly we're seeing um, a conflict in the making between black Africa and the Arabization of Africa which is dangerous and, uh, and appalling in humanitarian terms. And it's something that the, the Western world needs to wake up to very quickly indeed. I think I spent a very happy and fascinated holiday on, um, on Lamu Island off uh, the coast of uh, Kenya some years ago. And if ever you're, you become inspired and fascinated by the whole tradition of Arab traders and the Daos and the influence of Islam and the mosques in East Africa, then Lamu is the place to see it. I think it would be a fascinating um, part of the world to write about in the context that I believe you're talking about. So I haven't done it, and I don't believe I am competent to do it. There are many, um, a friend of mine called Graham Boynton, who uh, works in, in London, used to be a colleague of mine in New York, is a very uh, serious writer on Africa, and he would be an ideal person to do it. But maybe, in, indeed, you would be. It's an absolutely fascinating part of the world. As far as the internet is concerned, well, I do use it. I, I, I have a, a large library of, of books, and I find myself, if I can picture what I was doing when I left home yesterday, yes, my computer was center stage, so um, I'm constantly interrogating it. But beside me, to the left and the right, are huge piles of, of opened books. So whether it is uh, the Britannica or the OED or the um, dictionaries of one sort or another, or whether it's reference material, papers, the Bulletin of the Seismological Society of America, or Susan Huff's Earth-Shaking uh, World, or Science. Um, there are books aplenty that I refer to. So generally speaking, the internet is for the little sort of aperçus that I feel I need to flesh something out. But to get a deep knowledge of anything, you've got to read the books. And so it's while the internet is enormously useful as an add-on, it's certainly not, although it's center stage in my desk, it's not, I don't think, center stage in what I do. Gosh, I haven't. I have to confess ignorance. It's a wonderful name as well. Um, no, I shall have to look up Albion Seed. This is presumably the, the English progenitors mm -hmm. of America and how the way the eccentric or annoying or whatever it is, way we behave has become, <laughs> has evolved within American society. I'd be absolutely fascinated. The only 
tangle I had ever with writing about British characters in, on a largish canvas was a, a book I wrote about the British aristocracy back in the 1970s, and that book suffered very badly, as I was mentioning, at the hands of uh, lawyers, and it had to be withdrawn from the bookshops. So me writing about Britain is something that I, I do very, very carefully, although I continue to be fascinated by Britain, f absolutely fascinated by the, the class system. One of the reasons I live so happily in America is that it is blessedly free. And although Americans say, well, of course, there's the class system in America, it is nowhere near as pervasive as in, and as insidious as it, as it is in Britain. And I'm still fascinated by this aspect of British society, which will not go away. And I'd be interested to see whether Albion Seed suggests that any of those class-related prejudices have inserted themselves into American life. It's a, it's not a sad story, but it, it's, well, it's, it's going to happen one day. I was going to say I used to have a full head of hair, but I tear it out with frustration. The story, in its essence, is that Luc Besson, first of all, bought the rights, and then he bought the story in its entirety, so it was no longer an option. And then he did a deal with Mel Gibson's production company. It was at that point that it became rather complicated. And Gibson, did he want to make it? Didn't he want to make it? Well, he was too busy making other films for year after year after year. And the current thinking is, by my agent, that now he's finished with the passion. He's, he's already uh, appointed a, a director, John Borman. They've suggested actors, but the actors have aged six years since the book came out, so maybe that would no longer be appropriate. My agent rang the other day and, and said, the film's going to be made in September. That's the good news. Uh, the bad news, it's in, it's in Aramaic, which was what the passion was in, if you remember. <laughs> he was joking. <laughs> But I'd believe anything these days, so I would like Mel Gibson to get off his elegant backside and make my film. <laughs> I mean, in 1998, when the film, when the book first came out and everyone was briefly excited in the way Hollywood gets briefly excited, it was going to be Dustin Hoffman who was going to play W.C. Minor. Um, Billy Connolly was going to play James Murray, which I think would be a, a wonderful idea. And my absolute heartthrob, Helena Bonham Carter, was going to play the widow of the man that W.C. Minor murdered, Eliza Merritt. And I thought, my God, and I'm going to be allowed on the set, and I'm going to get to meet Helena Bonham Carter. This would be absolutely wonderful. And then they said, and a further piece of good news is that the man who gets murdered and who dies in the first five minutes of the film is going to be played, Mr. Winchester, by you. So I would have a few seconds of fame sort of horizontal Hitchcockian moment where I get to lie on the ground and moan. Well, I wish it had happened, but it hasn't, and I've, I've just got on with my life, and one day, perhaps, it'll happen. But uh, to the caller, if you're frustrated, believe you me, I am too. <laughs> well, I have a... It all goes back to a bookstore, now defunct, in Salisbury, Connecticut, called Lion's Head Books. Um, wonderful man owned it, and a great friend of his was a lady called Carol Blinn, who runs a press in East Hampton, Massachusetts, called the Warwick Press, or as I would say, the Warwick Press. And Carol, who's become a great friend, um, I should go back in time a bit and say that when I first became interested in the Oxford English Dictionary, and this is maybe 20 years ago, I suppose, a friend of mine at OUP in Oxford rang me to say that Oxford was no longer going to print the dictionary's letterpress. That, in other words, with a, a plate that physically presses on an ink, inked piece of metal presses onto the paper. They were no longer going to do that. It was going to be done by photolithography or with computers. So all the printing plates for the thousands upon thousands of pages that had gone up to make the original OED were being melted down and disposed of. Before they were, he said, would you like one or two of the plates? And I said, I'd absolutely love, what a wonderful souvenir. So I went to the warehouse and was given two plates. So I chose one was the word iris, and the other was page 450, I think, of volume five, which is the word humor, humorist, and humoral. And I gave iris away to a friend of mine in Hong Kong, and I don't know what's happened to it.
But I carried the page with humorist and humoral around with me all over the world for years, and I became a real bore showing it and saying, this piece of metal, they actually printed, this kissed the pages that produced the OED. And eventually, not knowing what to do with it, I heard from this chap at Lion's Head Books about Carol Blinn, showed it to her, and she said, I will print two pages, two proof pages of this for you, letterpress. And she did, one in China red and one in Oxford blue. And I had them mounted, or she had them mounted for me, with the original plate in the middle. And I've kept this as a, as a talisman in my house ever since, and Carol inspired me to investigate the joys of letterpress printing. So about three years ago, I bought a small Chandler and Price hand printing set, which theoretically, it's in the basement at the moment, um, would sit on a desktop and I would print greetings cards or name cards or that sort of thing. But my real ambition is to put in one of the barns a van der Kook, I think it's a 100 uh, proofs printing press, and start printing properly. And what I'd really like to print um, is I took some courses down in New York City at the Center for Book Arts, and what I'd really like to be able to print is Chinese poetry. And so that's my point in going with Elaine off to China to learn Chinese and ultimately can produce something by Li Bai or one of the great Tang Dynasty poets. And it would be something beautiful to look at and something beautiful to be able to read and to read to people. So it's a, it's a little foible, but it's something that I, interests me. Yes, I decided a couple of years ago that I would make a big attempt to, to go back and read the Mayor of Casterbridge. After all, I went to school in Dorchester in Dorset, which is the town on which Casterbridge was modelled. And I then very much got into Thomas Hardy and started reading um, you know, all, the, all the others, Tess of the D'Urbervilles and Far From the Madding Crowd, and absolutely loved him. Lately essentially at random, because I adore Russia, and I particularly adore uh, Gogol, um, Dead Souls, I think it was called. Um, I decided that I really should get to know a little bit more about Pushkin, so I, I started reading Pushkin, which is what I'm reading at the moment. So I'm afraid my writing is terribly non-contemporary. It's very old-fashioned, staid, and, and, and last night at Jean Meisel's house, I was reading Thomas Mann's uh, Buddenbrooks and thinking, my God, why has 60 years gone past and I have never read Buddenbrooks? Because it's an absolutely wonderful book. I wouldn't get out of bed this morning to come down here because I want, wanted to read it. But the book that above all, I, I don't want to so much emulate, but it's, it's the gold standard for the kind of book that I want to write, is a book that I just, I feel so strongly about that should be on everyone's bedside table which is a book called Life a User's Manual by Georges Perec, P-E-R-E-C, but pronounced rather like Perec in mm -hmm. Polish. And that, to me, it's difficult to explain what it's about, except that it's totally readable, and you read it, and you think, my God, every aspect of the human condition is somehow encapsulated in parts of Georges Perec's book. So it's a book which is a little difficult to get. It's still in print in Britain. I'm not sure whether it's in print here. It may be someone like David Godin in Boston has done it. But it's a wonderful, wonderful book. So take it from me. It's always there, along with you know, one or two standard volumes of poetry and things. But I'm afraid I'm very much of a slacker as, I mean, I haven't read the Jonathan Franzen, and I haven't read much modern novels. And I feel I'm slipping behind terribly, because Jean reads and Elaine reads uh, very voraciously, and I just don't. I think this goes back to James Morris, my, my mentor. I have no um, doubt at all that the books that James later Jan wrote about Venice, about Spain, about Oxford, about Britain, the Oxford Book of Oxford, dedicated as he wrote to the Warden and Fellows of St Anthony's College, Oxford, except one. I thought it was so wittily cruel. But Jan has an extraordinary mind and this extraordinary ability to to communicate relatively difficult ideas to people in a, in a compelling, compelling way. And I try and do the same. And the one device that I use that convinces me whether or not I'm likely to be able to explain it, for instance, at the moment, I'm trying to explain the origin of the very, very early continents in the world, long before Pangaea and Laurentia, the really, really old ones, Rodinia, Canora land, Ur is at the end of a day's writing to read it out loud. And I, to me, standing up and declaiming in the same way as with declamatory poetry, 
convinces me whether I can feel myself getting flat and boring. And you think, if I'm flat and if I'm boring myself when I'm reading this, then as sure as anything, I'm going to be boring the reader. So I would re re redo it. So I would give a piece of advice that I give to my students. I mean, I talk to them about persistence and primacy of the idea, but also as a simple practical reality, stand up and read what you've written. And if it doesn't sound right when you read it, it doesn't read right either. I've taught just at two places, really, um, the University of Chicago about three years ago for both cases, just a semester, and lately at San Jose State, which is a wonderful institution in uh, Northern California. And so I lived, it was rather odd, actually. I was sitting in my study in Massachusetts saying to Elaine, you know, I think I ought to go and live in San Francisco for a few months if I'm writing a book about the earthquake. Ten minutes later, the telephone rang, and a chap said, um, Hello, Mr. Winchester. This is Paul Douglas. Uh, you won't know me. I'm the uh, head of the English department in a university which you also may not have heard of called San Jose State in Northern California. We wonder whether you'd like to come over and teach for the four months of the winter 2003 to 2004. There'll be a small amount of money and housing will be provided. So I thought, God is in his heaven. This is quite remarkable. Well, I think that, yes, that, that is what I do, if you like. And, and people that are involved with me throw up their hands at my enthusiasms. I suddenly say, you know, I'm fasc fascinated with this particular, you know, Armenian bishop who lived in the fourth century. I think I'm going to go and live in Armenia. And they say, no, come on, no one is going to read a book about an Armenian seventh century bishop. But out of all this, sort of ferment of enthusiasm, occasionally good ideas do come. And I think it, it goes back to what James slash Jan said to me, just never lose your sense of wonder and sense of inquiry. There are so many amazing stories to be told in the world. I mean, I, every day, these, uh, someone was telling, we were talking last night about this chap called Hereward Thimbleby Price, who was a ludicrous name. He was a professor of English at the University of Michigan, but his story it was extraordinary. I mean, he was born in Madagascar, came and worked in England as a young man for the Oxford English Dictionary, which is where I came to know him. He married a German woman in 1913, went and lived in Germany, was in, pressed into the German army to fight against the English, which was odd enough, which he did, but was then moved to the Eastern Front, fought against the Russians, was captured by the Russians. The Russians then had the Bolshevik Revolution. He was sent to Siberia. He escaped, walked across Siberia to China, ended up in Hong Kong, wrote a book called From Bosch to Bolshevik, and then came to, back to England and to America and then became a member of the English department at the University of Michigan. That story cries out to be told by somebody. So perhaps someone who's watching this today, someone sitting in Ann Arbor in that wonderful uh, bookstore, The Shame and Drum, should go there and find all they can out about uh, Hereward Thimbleby Price. You'll never forget his name and write a book about him. This is a barn which came from um, northern Vermont. I think it was built as a granary in about 1820. And I saw it and um, it was dismantled by a man who lives in southern Vermont, in Windsor, Vermont. And he took all the beams and the posts and the pegs down and um, made sure that they were solid and free from rot and degeneration after what what 180 years I suppose and then he kept them in his warehouse in Windsor for a while and then I had a basement dug here and a platform and then one day about two two and a half years ago a group of six extremely strong looking looking young men from Vermont came down with all the posts and beams and in no more than six hours just re-erected the whole thing up here and then they went away and then my contractor here put insulation and electricity and sheetrock on the inside and green and white clapboard on the outside and has turned it into this exquisite little barn library, I suppose you'd call it. The only problem is, although however beautiful it is, and I think it's just charming, it's rapidly getting too small because as each time I do a book, I amass a huge number of reference books, I mean, like all these behind me are San Francisco books, and indeed most of the ones in front of me too. And when the San Francisco book is finished at the end of this year, I'll store them somewhere up on these shelves and bring in all the books for the next one, which is a book on a French mathematician. So um, 
I think I'm going to have to buy another barn, but uh, I think it's a lovely thing to do because how much better to preserve a barn that was otherwise just going to decay and fall to pieces in the winters in northern Vermont and give it a whole new life and uh, a life so very different from its initial life. For me, it's quite important to get up and leave the house and walk over to this building and shut the door and treat it just like an office. It's sort of scholarship and thinking and intellectual kind of business. And then the moment I leave and go back, then it's TV or running or playing with a dog or whatever. So this is quiet and I can just look into the woods and there's no real distraction. Well, I came here two or three years ago and I think I had this idea that one day I would become a sort of hobby farmer. Well, I couldn't afford it, but then came the professor and the madman in 1998, which brought in a bit of cash, and I could all of a sudden begin to realize that this ambition was something I might be able to realize. So I've got 75 acres here. Most of it was forest. It used to be um, owned by Ukrainian Jews, and oddly enough, it was said that this was the house that the Rosenbergs were arrested in before they went for their execution in the 1950s. And indeed, in the woods over there, there's an old 1950s Studebaker, ruined and rusted, obviously, but clearly abandoned for some funny reason in my woods. So even though the story's probably not true, it's some, something rather nice, because I'm a great admirer of the Rosenbergs. I want to have some goats and maybe some pigs. I don't think I want to cow. The farm is at long last coming together. I've called it Barn Hill Farm because there are two barns and they are on a hill. I'm about 1,550 feet high here, so I'm on the top of a hill. And Barn Hill was the name of the farm in, on the Isle of Jura in Scotland, beside which I've got another little house on an island. And it was the house that George Orwell lived in when he wrote, among other things, 1984. So Orwell's a great hero of mine and to be able to call a house here in Massachusetts after the house that he had in Scotland is a, I mean, it's, I'm sure some people would think it's rather pretentious, but I think it's rather a nice thing to do. Uh, yes, it was. And uh, I thought that I needed to construct an office away from the house, otherwise there are so many distractions in the house itself. And uh, I must admit, when they brought it down and built it, and these, it was an August day, and these six chaps from Vermont, all looking like Chippendales, strippers sort of oiled all the village women came it was quite disgusting <laughs> they all came and looked i became my dirt road became briefly notorious oh it's fairly simple although i got into all sorts of hot water for writing this big piece in the uh in the atlantic monthly about four or five years ago i think all i was saying was that roger's thesaurus was constructed initially by roger in the spirit of classifying words. He wanted to, in the same way that Linnaeus was classifying animals and plants, he wanted to classify words, parts of speech, and just show the association between words. He was not producing a table of synonyms, and of course, I would argue that there is no such thing as a synonym. Each word is essentially for its own subtly different aspect of description or action or whatever from everything else. It's not entirely true, but generally think it, uh, I think it is. The trouble is that Roger's thesaurus has become used by, generally speaking, people who are, well, let me say lazy people who simply want a synonym for another word. And they turn to Roger, which is a classificatory system without any definitions or any explanation of why the choice of this word would be actually better or not so good as the choice of the original word and they just wholesale take a word out of the list and plonk it down in the sentence and the sentence invariably as a consequence sounds pretentious or stiff or ill-mannered or whatever I had an example of this and I think I quoted it in the book in, in, in the article in the Atlantic a chap was talking about planting geraniums and he said that he didn't like the fact that after he had tamped the earth down, his fingers came out earthy. Now, earthy is a perfectly nice Anglo-Saxon word of antiquity and a word that Orwell, who loved Anglo-Saxon words, would have loved to have used.
but it wasn't good enough for this student. He thought he would the better impress his professor if he turned to Roger and looked up Earthy in the index, and it went to 692 or something, and he looked up 692, and there was Earthy, and he chose out of it the word that appeared in the sentence. I do not like the look of my fingers after I've been planting geraniums because they are chthonic. C-H-T-H-O-N-I-C, which does mean of the earth, of the bowels of the earth. And you talk about, you know, vapours coming up from the chthonic earth. He was entirely wrong, and it was Roger's fault he was wrong. Roger should provide definitions, should provide sort of order of precedence, of suitability of words. So all I'm saying is that Roger, a table of classification used by people who don't know what they're using, is a book that produces sloppy writing and should therefore not be used. I think if you do it over much, it's not good. But I think, generally speaking, is it not the duty of writers to try and continue to enrich our language and not allow words that are beautiful, attractive, useful to die from a lack of use? If you were to look at USA Today or a newspaper like that, I mean, it uses maybe, I don't know, 2,500 words, maybe 5,000 words of the lexicon that its editors and writers use to put into the, into the newspaper. But there are 695,000 words, of which 480,000 were in the first OED and 690,000 in the contemporary o OED. Surely we can find it time, the necessary energy, to take some of these words before they fall into desuetude, to use the classic kind of word that is itself falling into desuetude, and rescue them and put them in our writings. Anthony Burgess was the great champion of that. I mean, you look at Burgess's writing, and it's full of not words that are wrong or pretentious. I mean, that's what you want to avoid, and that's why you've got to be very careful not to insert words just for the heck of it and you end up looking inflated or pretentious. But if you can do it in a way that actually when the reader does go to the dictionary, says, yeah, that's right, and I'm jolly glad that I've learned that word, then a service has been rendered on all sorts of levels. That's a very interesting question. It just shows how astonishingly interrelated everything is at the moment with oil. I mean, who knows the importance of oil in the situation in the Middle East at the moment? It was absolutely goes without saying. China is motorizing itself at an astonishing rate. I mean, the, it is quite unbelievable that, the, as I'm sure you have read, there have been articles in the last few weeks about the car factories that are going up all over China, the roads that are being built all over China. I mean, we think in America that this is an automotive society. It is going to be nothing compared to China in another five years. So where in this steadily diminishing a reserve of oil that we're aware of, is a country like China going to get petroleum from? It's going to have to look. It's clearly not going to get much Athabascan tar sands oil from Canada. America wants its own oil for itself. So it goes to, to somewhat out of the way countries, of which Sudan is, as you rightly say, one. Well, the Sudanese government backs these, this militia, the Janjaweed, who are doing all this terrible, terrible humanitarian damage in, in western Sudan, in Darfur. And it, it is absolutely right what you say, that China has enormous leverage, potential leverage. China, however, is not at the moment good at using its leverage, either at the United Nations or in, generally in, in world public opinion. It's very diffident about doing so. It has the potential to do so. Will it do so here? Well, nobody else seems to be doing it, and the Western powers, certainly not, and the United Nations powers, still backing off from saying whether or not there's true genocide happening in Darfur. The Chinese may well have a role to play, and I think it's absolutely fascinating. It's completely non-germane to what we're talking about in terms of books, because I have no knowledge of this, but I think it's a fascinating point you raise, and I would love to see the Chinese doing something about it. No, I, oddly enough, I was only in danger once, and it, that was a horrible situation. Now I'm remembering it. What I did was, I was in London, briefly, I don't know what I was doing there, but I was having lunch with a, a friend of mine called Con Coughlin, who works for the Sunday Telegraph. So I had lunch, and I went back to my hotel, and there was a telephone call, and it was Con. 
He said, Simon, you're going back tonight to New York or Washington? I said, yes, I'm going on the 6 o'clock. And he said, are you very busy back there? And I said, not desperately. Why? And he said, well, would you mind going to Kosovo, which was just beginning? So I said, um, OK, I'll fly to, and you had to fly to Greece and go through um, southern Macedonia. So I did that. I flew that night. And I had this bizarre realization. I won't try and make too long a story, but it actually has some relevance to Washington. When I lived here in Washington, I lived 3310 Cummings Lane. And across from me was this friend of mine called Jean Meisel. And her husband, who's since passed away, was a very close friend of mine. Well, in 1976, I think it was, I was posted to India. I'd left Washington. And I decided that I would drive to India. I would drive my car from Oxford, where I then lived, to India. And two days before I was due to leave, Albert, who's working for the National Archives here in Washington, rang up and said, I hear you're driving to India. Could you give me a lift to Tehran? And I said, yeah, sure, OK. So providing I said you turn up at the Guardian office at 12 o'clock on this particular Friday, there's room in the Volvo, I'll take you to Tehran, and then I'll drive on to India. So he flew over, and there he was. Picked him up, drove to Dover to catch the ferry. And as we did so, we passed Canterbury Cathedral, going past at sort of 70 miles an hour as I was driving down the M2. And Albert said, wasn't that Canterbury Cathedral? And I said, yes. And he said, aren't we going to stop? And I said, no, Albert, I'm sorry, I'm in a hurry. This isn't tourism. I've got to be in India before the monsoon. And he was a bit grumpy about it. Anyway, we got on the boat and we crossed over to, uh, to Belgium, I think it was, Dunkirk. And then the next day, passed Cologne Cathedral, also at 60 or 70 miles an hour. And he said, aren't we going to stop? And I said, Albert, I'm sorry, I've got to get to India before the monsoon breaks. And he got really grumpy. And so I didn't want to sever the friendship. And so once we got to, I think it was Budapest, I decided that rather than just go on the straight road down into Greece and Turkey, the conventional way, I would turn right and go down the Dalmatian coast into Yugoslavia, as it was then. And so we did. We went down the coast and went to these places like Dubrovnik and Split and did tourism. And, and Albert became much happier and the journey became much more congenial. Well, then you come to the Albanian border. You couldn't in those days go any further. So we turned left up away from the coastline into the province, as it was then, of Yugoslavia called Montenegro and headed down into an area which I didn't know what it was called, but it was clearly what is today's Kosovo. And we passed through this area. And I remember vividly going through a deep gorge and coming out at the top of the gorge into a water meadow. And you could see in the distance, you've got on the right-hand side, you've got the mountains of Albania. And in the far distance, you've got the heat haze of Greece because you're in Macedonia. You're getting olive trees and it's starting to become hot. So we park our car by this water meadow and lie, get out the blankets and there was I think four of us in the car, and we drank some wine and smoked some cigarettes, and there was a little train, steam train, and it was a moment of pure idealism. And then we got back in the car and drove to Skopje and then down to Alexandropolis and then to Istanbul and then to Tehran and eventually Afghanistan and into India, Pakistan and India. So here I am now, 20 years later, being asked by the Sunday Telegraph to go to Kosovo, well, when I arrive in Skopje, before I'm in Kosovo, I find that the commanding general of the NATO forces is an old friend of mine from Northern Ireland called Mike Jackson. And I ring him up and he said, oh, Simon, what are you doing? And I said, well, I've just come here because the Telegraph wants me to write a piece. And he said, well, we haven't seen each other for 15 years. Come along. In fact, I'm just going to Kosovo in my helicopter, so you can come along with me. So I felt very grand and privileged, and I got into saw old Mike had a drink, got into his helicopter, you know, heavily guarded sentry helicopters, gunships. It was all very exciting. And we hovered over this field that was black with refugees coming from Kosovo uh, with the Serbian guns and all sorts of problems. Well, we landed in this field. And I thought to myself, as all the refugees scattered to make room for the helicopter, I said, do you know, I think I'd been here before. And it was the very same field that Albert Meisel and I had had a picnic in when we were driving through the undivided 
Yugoslavia. Uh, Yugoslavia before the borders with Serbia and Croatia and Montenegro and Macedonia and Kosovo had been created. And so it gave me an extraordinary perspective and I wrote a piece and Larry Ashmead, the name I've mentioned a couple of times today, saw this piece and said, you know, you should write a piece about a book about the situation in the Balkans. And so I decided the way I'd do it was to make a journey going from the two cities that represent, if you like, the polar axes of the problem in the Balkans. And that would be Vienna, the Austro-Hungarian Empire's headquarters, and Istanbul, the Ottoman Empire, because the Balkans is essentially the clash between you know, Christianity, Catholicism, and Islam in southeastern Europe. And so I made this scimitar-like journey, which ended up with me turning up back halfway through the journey in Skopje on the eve of the NATO invasion, led by Mike Jackson. And so he said, oh, you're back again. Well, nice to see you. We're going into Kosovo today. Would you like a tank? So he gave him, well, it obviously had a driver, but we drove in in a tank to Pristina, the capital of Kosovo. And then I had to write 2,000 words. So I wrote it frantically on, I had my laptop with me, but I needed to transmit it, and it was impossible to find an RJ-11 clip, and I couldn't. We were in Pristina, which is a town completely destroyed by war. And I had a cell phone. But the cell phone tower, there was no electricity, so there was no signal. So I had 2,000 words on a laptop with a failing battery, and very, very angry Serbs on all sides. I mean, hating people like me, hating the NATO forces, but the NATO forces had tanks. We didn't have tanks. So... And I had no way to get the story out, but then suddenly the electricity returned, and I thought, my God, I can now dictate this story. So using the cell phone, I dialed the number in London and asked to be put through to copy the copy takers, these cynical old men who take down on a typewriter and say things like, oh, is there much more of this? Is they're typing down what you think is your lyrical prose. But I was chased out of the hotel lounge by two Serbs with machine guns, and I had to go and hide, and I, the only place I could find was the lavatory. And so I sat in this cubicle in the loo, dictating to London in sort of sotto voce 2,000 words on the invasion, the NATO recapture of Kosovo, while I, these, and I would say to the copy taker, shut up for a moment, will you? And he's just smoking his fag in London and just having a nice time, and he doesn't give a toss about me. And I'm saying, don't ask me any questions. There's a chap with boots and a rifle marching around in the loo looking for me. But he never found me. I managed to dictate the piece and it made the front page. And that was not pleasant, I must say. To be perfectly honest, USA Today has always been very nice to me, and they've, they've written a very nice profile once, and uh, they've written some extremely nice reviews. I think the books pages of USA Today are super, but um, I do think that uh, the standard of writing is fairly lamentable. But I adore, the, and I know Harry Evans, who's profiled today, and um, Harry is another of my great, great idols, He's profiled in one of those marvellous interviews in the Colour magazine of the New York Times today. Uh, he's a great man, and he's always been somewhat disdainful of the New York Times as being sort of uh, somewhat boring and unimaginatively designed, and he's a great newspaper design man, um, and not very well written. But I would defend the Times. I think it's wonderful, and I thought the piece that they wrote last week about um, these police surges, I don't know if you read it, about how 60 police cars suddenly all... Uh, surge to one particular location in Manhattan at the moment. It's a thing that I've never seen. Elaine has seen it and it's apparently spectacular to watch. The piece they wrote about that last, I think it was Wednesday, was pure poetry. So I think there is still some wonderful writing and most of it to be found in the Times. I think that the Rosenbergs were shoddily treated. I think rather than saying I admire them, I mean I admire the efforts that were made by a number of intellectuals to share the nuclear secrets so that no one country had a monopoly on nuclear secrets. We had Klaus Fuchs, of course, who did much the same thing. And I think he was inspired by a, an idealistic and I think generally good moral compass. Um, so I thought that the way America rounded on the Rosenbergs was unfair and I'm very much against the death penalty anyway. So. The fact that they were executed, I think, is monstrous. And the reasons, when you look at it, uh, given the big picture, I think were pretty monstrous too. So I wouldn't say I'm an unalloyed admirer of the Rosenbergs, but I'm very sympathetic to their, their plight and what happened to them. That's a very interesting question. I've not really thought about it, so I can't give you a numerical answer. I know that 
Orwell, we were talking about Orwell earlier, believed firmly that uh, the, the, the language should be pared down to its essential Anglo-Saxon essentials and that the, the word stock could usefully be much, much more limited than it was preserving all the subtleties of the English language and uh, no one would suffer at all. So it clearly is, if you take out all the words that have their origins in, in Greek and Latin and Old Dutch and High German and all the, the Lettish and all the other languages that, that you had learned yourself, um, I'm certain we would probably get along fine. Um, what would that number be? 850 sounds inspired. I imagine the editor of that book must have thought that 850 is the number. But can you imagine? I mean, there must be 850 words for the red colour that describes roses. Would you wish to live in such a stripped-down lexical universe? I think I wouldn't. The fact that there are 690,000 words that are available to pick and choose just so enriches the tongue we speak. We are, I believe, I'm not 100% certain, but I think we are the language which has the greatest word stock of all, which is one of the many reasons, I suppose, where English, like it or not, is becoming rapidly the world language. Um, so I would regret it bitterly if it was stripped down to its bare essentials, but it obviously can be done. No, I, I absolutely think it should be used. And I, I, I'm charmed that you, an exaltation and a shimmering is part of your vocabulary. I think it should be everyone's. I, was, I had to give a talk about a year ago in Miami to a conference of Barnes & Noble's booksellers, 1,500 booksellers. And I stood up there not knowing on earth what I was going to say, and I said I was trying to think what a good collective noun would be for a gathering of booksellers. And my first thought was it should be a groaning of booksellers because the groaning shelves that they represent. But then I thought, no, actually what you are, you're a charm of booksellers because how much more charming could it be than to come into a town at night and to see the glow of the lights of a bookstop store, you know you're going to be in good company. So they were thrilled that they think now the official collective noun for a gathering of booksellers is a charm of booksellers, as charming a word in its own way as I think a shimmering, a business of flies, a, a murder of crows, and an exaltation of larks. Wonderful. Keep them in the language, please, and let's have more of them. Well, uh, biography, I think, never. I don't honestly think. I don't think so, no. I just, there are so many other good and far better stories to write, I think, that I would, I, I would find it embarrassing. I, it's difficult enough being on this program and talking about being in a hospital at 19. No, I don't think so. Um, second question. As you spoke, I, I love Elman's biography of Oscar Wilde. I think it's a, absolutely majestic. I'm fascinated with Wilde, great human being extraordinary, complex, difficult man. Elman's, uh, Elman has died now. He's, of course, one of the authors with um, Eau Claire and another chap of the um, compendium, the anthology of modern, of modern verse, which most students in this country use. So I, he was a great biographer, and that is a particularly great biography. And then your last question related to, well, I still think I, I feel rather disloyal being in Washington and saying how much I like the New York Times, but I think no newspaper writing the rough draft of history and all the stuff that we know, the, all those cliches, is, is perfect. But I think the job that the journalists on that paper particularly do is, is just splendid. I, I have boundless admiration for, the, for what the Times of London used to be at the time mm. when James Morris was writing from Mount Everest in 1953 to the Times of New York as it is today attempting to be a dispassionate journal of record, interspersed, leavened with amusing comments on the, on the oddities of the day. But generally speaking, I think it is a newspaper who has opinion pages, and people like Maureen Dowd and Bill Sapphire state their opinions in a trenchant and colorful way. But on the news pages, I think, generally speaking, and of course, the selection of news is a subjective practice, so you can't say that it's a totally objective um, reality, what's in the Times, but it does a pretty good job. And, and while I gather from your question that you think that other newspapers do not present an unbiased, uh, an, an opinion-free diet of news, and I would go along with you when you talk about some of the networks, which is why I, for one, bless C-SPAN for its existence, and I watched the 
the Democratic Convention in Boston only on C-SPAN, not on any of the commercial networks, I think there is still room in this country, and it exists for unbiased, unopinionated, straight news. When I was putting away the Krakatoa books, um, the ones that I used for reference, I noticed that two of them were sort of rather lurid titles from the 1920s and 1930s, Great Disasters of Modern Times, including the 1906 earthquake in San Francisco. And it was the second one, I was just putting it away and I saw that date, 1906. This was maybe 2003. And I thought, wait a minute, that means there's an anniversary coming up in 2006. And I rang Larry Ashmead, this man who you must be rather weary of me mentioning him, but I, he's such a wonderful publisher, now retired, sadly, but he's still, still in the background. And I said, Larry, this is Simon here. You realize that 2006, April the 18th, is the 100th anniversary of the San Francisco earthquake. And there was a silence and he said, don't say another word. And two days later, a contract arrived, essentially. So it's the only book I've ever done that didn't actually require a 15-page you know, proposal saying this is what I want to do. But ironically, perhaps it's the most difficult book I've tackled. Well, the book has been written by so many people. There are hundreds. I think there are about 2,000 books on the San Francisco earthquake. So what on earth have I got that's new to say? And it's, it's tricky. I mean, I, I'm enjoying the challenge. I've had a, a, this last week has been a very, very difficult week in writing it. But I can sort of see where I'm going. And, uh, but this is what makes it so, so fun. I remember in Krakatoa, about a third of the way through, I thought, no one is ever going to read this book. It is the most boring book, full of completely non-relevant stuff. And why would anyone want to read about a volcano in Indonesia in 1883 anyway? Well, here I think this is really difficult. And it's already been written about so many times before. So it's a real challenge to come up with something that, and I have no secret about wanting the books to do well. I mean, critically, that's the most important. But I'd like it not to be a disappointment commercially to the publishers. Because, of course, the corollary to that is that if you write something that nobody reads, they won't ask you to write anything else. So I do want people to read it. So I have to keep at the back of my mind, mind you know, the, the mantra of, from Jan. I mean, it's a wonderful story. And just tell it properly. This is uh, an old friend of mine called Kate Skirmerhorn, who has just married a, a film editor. Um, and the two of them came up with this idea that we'd like to make a documentary about something. And the process of writing a book, well, if you're simply the kind of person who writes a book, um, sitting in an archive somewhere, looking through papers, as I dare say Elman was when he wrote his biography of uh, Oscar Wilde, it's perhaps not visually very interesting. But this book required me to go to Alaska and to go the length of the San Andreas Fault and to sort of stride up mountains and do sort of manly looking things. So it's got certain visual appeal. So I said, well, let's give it a shot. Let's see what it's like. But one is very aware that having a television crew beside you distorts what you're trying to do. You can't be quite, if I go and see, as I'm going next week, to see an expert on insurance who knows more about the insurance claims made and the, the involvement of Munich Re, which is the German company which essentially underwrote all the insurance companies that were so badly hurt in 1906 in San Francisco, to go and ask this elderly gentleman in his house in California, the details of that. It'll be fine if I'm just sitting with him, but if I'm sitting with him and there's a crew beside me, everything gets slightly distorted. So I've given my commitment to them that I'm going to do it, but occasionally these days I think, I wish you weren't there. I wish you'd say, you've got enough material, just go and make your film. Uh, that's a very difficult question. I, I love the research, but it, the research continues when you're doing the writing. I think that's probably the answer. I love the process that I, even though I've had a bad week this week, I love what I do because you're continuing to do the research, which is fun. You're continuing to discover little nuggets of information as you go along, which is what makes the research such fun. But translating that into something that you hope the reader will like, that's fun as well. So the whole, the writing process is what I prefer. The definition of tautology is 
simply, in essence, saying the same thing twice. I mean, uh, I'm sure I'll think of an example in a moment, but uh, a, a tautologous irrelevancy is itself a tautology, really, because the irrelevancy is a tautology. Um, debate. Well, I must say, I, when I compare, and once again, I must applaud C-SPAN for this, you look at Prime Minister's Question Time on C-SPAN, and there you see real debate going on in Parliament. And for some reason, the Brits are schooled in having arguments. I love having arguments. I'm a very argumentative person, and discussions that become not fierce and personal, but which are in which you seek to win an argument or to persuade the person of what you believe is the rightness of your view is at the essence of debating. And for some reason, although I know there are debating societies and clubs in this country, it's a very different form of debating from the kind of thing I like and which you see when C-SPAN covers Prime Minister's Question Time or the British Parliament on the television here. So I do rather regret the, the lack of debating skills and argu argumentation. I would like to see much more of it whenever you see Capitol Hill. I think people would find it intellectually amusing and purifying and rewarding. And to have an enlightened argument would just be a good thing in a sophisticated democracy like this one. I think when Winston Churchill accused someone of being uh, inebriated with the uh, inebriated with the exuberance of his own verbosity. I think that was a wonderful way of saying that you've got verbal diarrhea when you're not allowed to use the word liar in the House of Parliament. He said, I didn't accuse him of lying, merely of uttering a terminological inexactitude. I think that's lovely, and I think that's what our language is for. And I would not like to see 850 words limit me to not using such words. I did. How yes, the very first issue, I think, of of Condé Nast Traveller, which Harry Evans, who I mentioned, was the editor of, yes. If I can just pick up on that briefly, but I know I'm speaking outside my brief, really, we all have to remember 2008 and the Beijing Olympics. I think China is going to be extremely well behaved. Um, the whole situation across the Taiwan Straits at the moment about what is going to happen um, with uh, the Taiwan Constitution and the Declaration of Independence. Will China do anything before 2008, or will she behave herself until she's won the goodwill of the world by allowing herself to stage a, a good Olympics in 2008. I think you might see a rather generally benign China in the next few years. You may accuse it of being a cynical and expedient series of gestures. But Sudan is a case where she could employ economic leverage against the government to clean up its act as far as Darfur is concerned. And while I think you're right to be deeply skeptical given what has happened in Tibet, um, there is a possibility that the new pre-Olympic China may be a rather different China from the one we've known. I, this is an area which a uh, person like Niall Ferguson, has, I, I, my competence extends to a small degree to the history of the British Empire and a deep fondness for China and a hope that China will, at least in, in terms of providing a, a counterbalance to America, try to, or it will have the ultimate effect of perhaps limiting some of the excesses of what some people regard as the new American empire. This is something which, when we were talking about earlier debate, I would love to have a debate about, although I think Niall Ferguson would be a far better person to be sitting in this chair debating. It's a subject that interests me, but as I think you'll realize with me writing about Krakatoa and San Francisco, although San Francisco in itself was an imperial city, which was from which people like Teddy Roosevelt very much wanted to dominate the Pacific Ocean. So there are imperial echoes in that story too. It's not a story that I really feel totally comfortable dealing with. Um, well, there's a laptop and there's a desktop. And uh, I take material from, I haven't actually brought it with me to Washington today, but um, I need the files to be portable. I'm a complete committed Macintosh fan. And uh, my only problem is a problem with speed of access in the country. The price you pay for the delights of living in a very remote community, Sandersfield, Massachusetts, is that you cannot persuade Verizon or I believe any other telephone provider to give you what you in metropolitan centers pay 29 95 a month for, and that's a DSL connection.
So I have a satellite connection, which is expensive and not good. Every time the clouds roll up with a summer thunderstorm, my internet access goes down. So I've had to make the really difficult decision. It begins on Tuesday to get a T1 line. You can get a T1 line, providing you're willing to pay for it. So I've just signed a two-year contract for a T1 line. I will have the fastest internet connection in Western Massachusetts. But believe me, I'll be paying for it big time. Well, the, the book itself, providing I get my skates on, will be finished on December the 31st. I've done, it's supposed to be 120,000 words long, and I've done about 40,000. So I should finish the bulk of the writing in late October and then go through this whole process of revising it and turning it into something that I'll be reasonably satisfied to show to the publishers. Then they will put it through the grinding mills of the publishing process and with, you know, in consultation with me will tinker with it and change it, and I hope not too terribly much, of course. And the plan is it for it to come out in November 2005 um, the anniversary of the earthquake is April the 18th, 2006, so this is about five months before the time at which there will presumably be a lot of other material. I mean, I'm very aware that when I wrote about Krakatoa, I was the only person writing about it. But writing about the San Francisco earthquake and knowing that there's the centenial, centenial, some centenary anniversary, in uh, two years' time, there are lots of other people making films, writing novels, writing screenplays, someone's composing a symphony, there are plays being produced, there are all manner of, there is a multimedia extravaganza related to this earthquake anniversary, and I will be one small lone voice in this. Um, so the hope is that it comes out in November, if the reviews are halfway decent, then I hope it'll have a life that leads it through to the anniversary itself in April. As far as the film that is being made, uh, I think you might have seen the clips earlier by this friend of mine, Kate Skirmerhorn, and her husband, Matt. Um, if that gets picked up, and of course we don't know, or they don't know, because it's really nothing to do with me, whether any uh, channel will pick it up, I would imagine it would probably be broadcast at about the same time as the publication of the book. So I would think that, too, would come out in November uh, 2005. Well, I've always been a supporter. When I lived in Washington in the 1970s, I listened to, I'm tempted to think it was WBAI, I can't quite remember the call letters, but there was a Pacifica station, and my great friend uh, who worked for the Pacifica station in those days, in the early 70s, was Judy Miller, who has later gone on to become a somewhat uh, controversial figure in the New York Times, I'm a very powerful reporter there. Um, I've always thought Pacifica has been a, a lone voice. I mean, yes, of course, NPR generally is just wonderful and alone and relatively loud voice. On the extreme left wing of that was Pacifica, and because I am much more interested in left wing politics than right wing politics, I would always happily tune into it and, and listen to their station in New York, their station in Washington, and their station in Berkeley. And I always go there, not least because the people that listen to the Pacifica stations tend to be great readers, tend to be great supporters of the kind of books that I write. So it's a pleasure and it's a commercially wise decision too. Gosh, as someone said, an entry level book. <laughs> <laughs> I think The Professor and the Madman actually, it's a, it's a very easy story to read and um, it'll give you a, it sounds terribly self-serving to say this sort of thing, but it'll give you a, an indication of the sort of thing I do and it's, it's, it's fun. You can read it in I've known many people that have read it in 24 hours or less. Well, I think this is a wonderful story. I mean, someone who goes to university, writes a thesis, discovers you can't write, discovers the joy of writing, and then discovers the joy of the purest of all forms of writing, which is poetry. I mean, the most difficult. I mean, it's easy enough to write a book. It's very difficult to write a short story. It's impossibly difficult to write a good poem. And I have the utmost admiration for anyone that writes poetry. There are dozens of small presses that publish anthologies of poetry. There's also a number of good uh, websites that publish poems online. I mean, I think of a, a new and very successful British publisher of poetry called Blood Axe Books, bloodaxe.com, I think, or it may be bloodaxe.co.uk, will look sympathetically at what you've done. But go out and give readings. That's almost the most important thing. Find one of your, in White Plains, I think, one of in New York City, there are dozens of bars that are given over or have evenings 
uh, the ear bar down in the, the West Village have regular poetry readings. Get on the list. It's rather like going to um, one of these comedy clubs. You've got to be brave. You've got to put your work out there for people to listen to. And going back to a point, I don't know if you were watching when we were talking about this earlier, I, in what I do, try and determine whether what I've written is readable or not by standing up and reading it out loud. And if I put myself to sleep, then I realize I'm going to put the reader to sleep. Well, similarly, standing up and reading, declaiming your poetry, and then declaiming it before an audience will convince you whether you're on the right track or not. If you do convince yourself or on, you're on the right track, and if rather than just a, a lukewarm couple of people applauding, you get a thunderous applause, then you know you are. And then approach someone like Blood Axe and put it between hard covers. It'd be a wonderful thing to do, and what a wonderful story. Well, I have to say that thus far, my dream life, I thought you meant the dream life that I live, because I often think that the life I live with a flat in New York, a nice farm in Massachusetts, and writing about things that interest me only is a dream of a life. I mean, I think I am totally blessed in the way that my life has shaken out. I'm so, so glad I was colorblind and could not be a captain of an aircraft carrier, which is what I wanted to be when I was 16 or 17 years old. But the dreams I have when I'm sleeping thus far, I don't think, have crept into anything I've I've written. I can't think of an occasion where anything I've dreamt has somehow manifested itself on the printed page in, in anything I've, I've read, I, I've written. Yes, very briefly, um, I thought of this as the most, one of the most dramatic examples of geology at work. Uh, and I thought of this because back in the 1970s when I was living in India, I happened to be in West Java. And I, I went, because I had a spare hour or so, to the very western end of the island of Java and to, to look at the tiny little island in the middle of the Sunda Strait, which was where this huge volcano erupted in 1883. And I looked at it and it was beautiful. And I took some photographs and thought no more about it. And then, almost exactly 25 years later, when I was living in Hong Kong, I went back to West Java again and was with a friend and took him down to see Krakatoa, because Krakatoa is very famous, not least because of that dreadful film, Krakatoa, East of Java, which manages to be, A, a dreadful film and with a dreadful title, because Krakatoa is actually west of Java. This time, when I saw it for the second time, it had grown. It had grown about 500 feet taller in the 25 years that I'd been away. And I thought any mountain that grows 500 feet in 25 years, that is in an incredibly exotic part of the world, that has such a lot of stories associated with it because it caused huge mayhem, killed 40,000 people, had tidal waves which swept as far away as the west coast of France, is something that deserves to be written about. It turns out that the, the last book that was written about it was in 1965. And the important thing there, and I don't want to get too boring about this, is that in 1965, no one knew why volcanoes erupted. Everyone knew where they were and the kind of mayhem that they did cause over the years. But as to why there are no volcanoes in Chicago, but there are volcanoes in Java and Sumatra, no one knew. And then two years later, 1967, came this theory of plate tectonics, which suddenly created a whole new science. And we were able to say, that volcanoes are where they are and do what they do because of this. And there was an explanation. So as the 1965 book didn't have this explanation, I thought I could have another go at telling the story, which was, in any case, a rather good story, but this time add the explanation of why it happened, and that's what the book is all about. And we got the name wrong. It's actually spelled Krakatau, but there was a mistransliteration in the cable that was sent to London, and it was wrongly spelled in the Times of London, this paper of record that I was extolling the virtues of earlier. And because everyone in England thought Krakatoa, that sounds a rather nice name, it's sort of redolent of wahinis in grass skirts and ukuleles being played and orchids. That's a nice word. That's, Krakatau sounds ugly. Krakatoa is more for it. And so the spelling mistake has been perpetuated ever since. No, except that uh, it has a lot to do with my weight. I'm trying, I'm, when you're a 60 year old man, you tend to, your tummy gets uh, fairly uh, extended from time to time. So um, I try now, and uh, I've got back into the routine in the last few days, oddly enough, that when the sun comes into my study windows in the summertime directly, because foolishly I slanted it directly east-west, and so at about five o'clock, 
I suddenly can't work. That's what I say to myself anyway. The sun is dazzling me, I can't see the computer screen. So I go over to the main house, go running down my dirt road to a lake, turn round, it's four miles there and back, and then shower, have a cup of tea. And by that time I go back to my study and the sun is now set and I'm able to write again. Well, I, I, to respond to that, I mean, once again, I'm thrilled that you're writing poetry and all power to your elbow, 50 odd years worth of poetry. I do hope you've had some published. I'd like to see many grown men weep over what you've, what you've written. But I do want to say one thing. I don't, if I have been at all critical of the press here and the networks here, the reason I live in this country is because I think there is no English-speaking country, at least, and I'm incompetent to talk about non-English-speaking countries, that so reveres the writer as this. I mean, there are serious magazines. There is The New Yorker, there's The Atlantic, there's Harper's, there is The New Republic. There are a huge number of very serious journals, magazines, The Paris Review. I could go on and on and on, and, uh, and you could too, that revere, publish, print, distribute the works of writers here and abroad, you know, and pay them to pay them respectable amounts of money. In Britain, where I come from, I mean, what have we got? We've hardly got anything. The Spectator and the New Statesman, who will pay, I mean, they're fun to read, but they, the writer doesn't feel necessarily privileged to be writing for them. He doesn't, you yearn to write for the New York Times. You yearn, if you're an English writing person, to get a piece in the Atlantic or the New Republic or the Nation. I'm so delighted that although there is a lot of very bad press and a lot of very bad television in this country, there is a lot of very serious and wonderful press and television, such as C-SPAN, which is, does not exist in the Europe, at least the Europe that I come from. There are book programs on television. There is, I used to present a books program on BBC Two in the 1980s. I presented the Booker Award to J.M. Kurtzay when he wrote Life and Times of Michael Kay. That program has long been axed. There is no book program on any American, on any British television network, but there is here in America. America is a country full of intellectual possibilities. It's full of rubbish, that is true. But out of that, there are pearls of immense value. Well, it's fraught with danger. I think that that's obvious uh, for the kind of danger that we're seeing in Russia at the moment, where there's a small number of people have huge amounts of money. There's a f tremendous amount of corruption. There's the old sort of command dictatorship, uh, command economy, the ruthlessness, the secret police, all of those kind of things. It's a mixture which is extremely potent. I'm not 100% convinced that democracy is necessarily the answer for all countries in the world, that it's necessarily the finest form of government in the world, or that it's necessarily appropriate for China. Uh, Elaine, who's just come back from, from Hong Kong, was saying that in many ways, China if you live in Shanghai today, you are inordinately free. You can do anything you want, essentially, except dissent, or dissent in a very particularly vociferous way. Absent that, it is a very, very free country. However, it is growing at an astonishingly and dangerous rate. It is becoming overpopulated with motor cars. I've spent a lot of time in the upper reaches of the Yangtze. Things are being destroyed of inestimable value in the Three Gorges and in further upstream. There is a sort of devil-may-care attitude that growth is the most important of all things. However, there are wise people running China. China has been around for five and a half thousand years. We in Britain, 2,000 at best. You in America, 250 at best. China knows how to run itself, and I'm confident that it will, in due course, not without some heartache, I dare say, along the way, shake itself out of the problems that it's facing at the moment. So there are going to be problems, but I have enormous, enormous confidence that a world in which China is hugely powerful is going to be a far better world than in which only America is hugely powerful. Well, the answer is no, and I also ought to temper what I said. I, I've, I've never studied them. I mean, simply living in Hong Kong for nine years, you become aware that Buddhism and Confucian ethics seep into your very being. You're just aware of, of values of duty to state and family, respect for the elders, and the Buddhist way of life. I have many friends who are keen and devout Buddhists, and I admire from outside, although with a little bit of knowledge from having lived among Buddhist people, I admire a lot of what they stand for. I'm not in the slightest bit studying it, if I can dignify it at that from an anthropological point of view. I 
believe that as I get older, I would like to embrace Buddhism and follow Confucianist ideals. So it is very personal, but it's something that I'm still grappling with and I, I can't say that I know enough, but I'm tremendously interested. And I find the, the, the moral code of Buddhism and the ethical code of Confucianism are things that I would like to at, at least consider being good enough to follow. I suppose I do. I mean, I, I think One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, of course, is a film which changed a lot of our attitudes to, to mental illness, gave us a greater degree of tolerance. Um, and certainly, uh, going back to talking about the East, there is rigid intolerance towards mentally unwell people there. I mean, when I was writing my book on Korea, these horrifying stories of uh, children who are clearly mentally unwell, or autistic, or schizophrenic, or whatever, being tied up with rope and just dumped in places for the, the city to look after them, or church to look after them. The basis of all intolerance towards anything is a lack of knowledge. I think once you know that uh, what that a mental illness can be is no different in its own way from a physical illness, and we're generally compassionate towards people that are physically ill, um, the more knowledge we get, the more likely we are to be tolerant. And I f certainly um, am very keen to talk about these episodes of um, electroconvulsive therapy. I had, I was in a terrible state when I'm 19. When I was 19. I went through something that was awful, but I came out at the other end, and I'm enormously grateful to the physicians that treated me, and feel similarly that any effort can be, that can be made to lessen mental affliction and be tolerant of those that suffer from it is, is, worth being, is worth making. Well, I have. I'm fascinated by coal. I have a funny feeling there is a new book about coal that has come out, mm -hmm. and if I'm wrong, then I think there should be a book about coal because coal, after all, hugely important for a thousand and one reasons in all industrialized societies and its um, involvement with the labor movement in this country, which was beginning when I was first came here in the 1970s when all these uh, disturbances in uh, West Virginia, I found journalistically fascinating. So I think ample room for a book on coal I admire and share your enthusiasm for anthracite, not a sentence I ever thought I'd utter. This is the diary I kept and I interspersed it with letters. And this letter, I, I don't think it'll take more than about four or five minutes to read, but I hope we've got time. But it's the end that's the mm -hmm. important. This comes from an old lady. How to begin to write anything to you that's not utterly boring. I was turning it over this morning as I shifted the electric fence for my two cows and felt I must find the nearest common denominator. Geographically, I was never further south than Bahia Blanca, where I spent one or two school holidays a long time ago. It was on a handsome old estancia founded by a Scottish family in the last century, and it was winter. I had memories of huge log fires and Aladdin lamps, and long sessions with a wind-up gramophone after coming in from riding. And outside, the greyish, wiry grass, I never saw the pampas green, it was always winter, the dirt roads frozen hard, the huge flat disk of the horizon with far-off groups of poplars like ships on the skyline. And I remember those wire fences bordering the roads, mile upon mile of them, and every now and then the carcass of a horse that had starved, imprisoned there on the road, unable to reach grass or water. Sometimes a living one or a small group, one used to look away to think of something else. That was easier in those days than it would be now. I suppose there are fewer horses now, I hope so. Further south, I can only go by proxy. At school, there was a girl from Commodoro Rivadavia and one from Santa Cruz. It was before air travel. They came to and fro by sea. They suffered badly in the mosquito season because it was said the cold climate had made their blood too rich and appetizing. No one came from Ushuaia, which was the town I was in prison in. It was only a penal settlement in those days for ordinary conflicts, I think. No one said anything about political prisons. I was reared in Paraguay and Argentina was never home to me, although I spent five years there. They were reluctant years, and I felt as trapped as you do. All my contemporaries had gone home to the war with the British Latin American volunteers, but my part German ancestry made me ineligible. My prison was larger than yours, but it was still prison. I used to think that the horizon line of the river plate was like a stone wall. Eventually, I saved enough from my reporter's salary to pay for my passage, and I escaped. The sense of relief was indescribable, but I can assure you that when your time comes, it will compensate for all the frustration and the isolation and anxiety you've suffered. Meanwhile, you're not forgotten. People who do not know you speak of you with concern. 
you know, frequently mentioned in the BBC and in the press, and I'm sure no string is left unpulled that could possibly speed things for you. In years to come, you will look back on this episode and it will not be entirely wasted. Nothing is. I live alone now, apart from my family of animals, my cows, my dog, my cat and my beloved ponies, in a cob-walled cottage in a tucked-away valley. Dartmoor lies to the south, blue on the skyline. The stream runs north to the Bristol Channel by way of the Torridge. It is a country of great oaks and wild daffodils and pheasants that squawk continuously at dusk. Right now the sky is full of swallows. I do not think that I shall move again. No, no, it's not. It's long out of print. Um, it's sad, but uh, no, it's not. <laughs> Thank you.